everyone, I am here, and man oh man, has it been a wild week for professional wrestling in both good ways and bad ways. And that good-bad dichotomy is pretty much synonymous with um, WWE and AEW, because one company hit it out of the park, and another one threw the banana peel in front of themselves. Again, but I'm going to go over all of that, but before I do, I want to make sure to plug a couple of things. Number one, um, if you want to submit questions for my upcoming question and answers video, I'm going to be restarting that now that we're past WrestleMania. Uh, you can submit your questions to askpatrick2024 at gmail.com. See the graphic down below and also see the description for that information. So if you want to participate, go ahead and do that. And also, check out the latest episode of Weekday Warriors of Wrestling. Eric and I returned to our podcast after a year off. The, literally, the last podcast we did was a review of WrestleMania 39. And uh, we came back for WrestleMania 40 because the show felt that big and that significant to the point where we felt like we had to say something about it. But uh, both of our, our schedules just got wildly out of whack because he is a new baby, I have a new baby, and uh, it was hard to reconnect. But we did it for WrestleMania because this show was significant significant enough to talk about and we're going to try and start uh, getting back into the habit of of doing weekday warrior episodes so be on the lookout for those but if you want to see the latest episode check that out the link is in the description so uh you also get a special appearance from my baby girl who i was holding while recording um she was not the best co-host very uncooperative but She's cute, so she gets away with it. Um, so, uh, God, what else is there to talk about? There's, um, wh what do you want to talk about? Uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of the stuff that went on WrestleMania weekend, both shows, a couple of the other shows that happened over the course of the weekend. Also, I will be talking about and giving my thoughts and review of the latest Godzilla movie, Godzilla X Kong The New Empire. I will be sticking that on at the end. Um, I couldn't see the movie until it had been, already been out for a week. And I'm reviewing it now almost a week after I saw the film. So I'm really late to the party on that one. But I'm a, I'm a Godzilla dork and I've got to talk about it on this channel. So uh, if you want to see my Godzilla X Kong review, stick around till the end because you will get that. But for right now, let's jump into the wrestling and... I think right now I should just go ahead and start with the fiasco that happened last night with AEW where um, following um, WrestleMania weekend and all the interviews and everything else that took place, um, more specifically the, uh, the CM Punk interview where he uh, opened up about what happened at All In and the whole situation there and outlined his, his version of events. I talked about it in my last video. And uh, WWE took a few other shots at AEW over the course of the weekends with Triple H making comments and Pat McAfee making comments. Um, um, Cody was very political about it, but uh, gave like vague statements about his wife being a scapegoat about certain things. Um, but it, it felt like, like AEW was just under fire the entire weekend, and I guess this was their way of answering back. And Tony Khan's uh, response was to actually show the all-in um, footage, the fight between Jack Perry and CM Punk, although it wasn't really much of a fight, as the footage revealed. Um, you know, it would have made a lot more sense for Tony to show this footage back in September, when Punk was like, oh, it's like, look, this happened at the show, Punk's not here, I've let him go, here's why, and just show the footage, and I think people would have been very understanding of it. It's like, okay, look, he's causing trouble backstage and, you know, and put a black eye on what should have been the biggest night in AEW history. Uh, one of the best shows they ever did. Huge stadium setting. Their WrestleMania. Huge success. And this whole situation with CM Punk just marred all any possible goodwill they could have gotten out of that show. What Again, what should have been a massive success uh, kind of blew up in their face. And... Uh, it would have made sense for Tony to show that footage back then to kind of go like, look, here's why, here's why I let Punk go, because this happened. And, uh, however, waiting until the week after WrestleMania uh, as a clearly a direct response to Punk's comments and showing the footage then, it didn't really... Now, now watching the, the footage as an unbiased observer, as, as unbiased as I possibly can be, um, it looked like Punk started it. It looked like I thought he sucker punched Jack Perry, but if you look at it again and kind of slow it down, this is this is gonna turn into like the JFK assassination footage. <laughs> the way people are gonna microanalyze every little thing that happened in this in this video. I watched it like ten times and I started 
looking at the way other people in the shot were reacting to certain things. So it's uh, this is going to be a highly scrutinized, a highly magnified, and overanalyzed uh, piece of footage. And it's like, what, a minute and ten seconds long? But it, it is what it is. Um, but it looked like Punk started it. It looked like, uh, like I said, it looked like he gave... Initially, when I first saw it, it looked like a sucker punch. Uh, instead, it was like a... It, watching it again, it looked like more of like a shove, which... You know, it's still Punk starting the physical element of it. Of course, there's no audio, so we couldn't hear what was said uh, between Perry and Punk. Although I have no reason, uh, based on what I saw in the footage, I have no reason to really doubt um, Punk's version of, of the events uh, like and what Perry said to him. Uh, and then he locked Perry in the chokehold. They got separated. And then it looked like Punk was like yelling at somebody who was slightly out of out of the shot. Um, and it's believed that that was like the little, like the gorilla position area where Tony Khan was stationed and Punk like lunged at him and started screaming at him or whatever. And, uh, that's, you know, I, I, this whole footage was designed to kind of like, I don't know, make Punk look bad and, and give a direct response. It's like, well, here's what actually happened and show what actually happened. Uh, it looks like Punk's version of events is not that far off except for like, you know, where he said, it's like, I was professional and calm and everything. And I'm like, N -n no, you probably weren't. And sure enough, you know, you go back and watch the footage. And yeah, he went up to Perry and he started the physicality. In fact, Jack Perry came out of that looking really bad because he didn't get any shots in. It was all punk. It wasn't much of a fight at all. Um, but uh, it, it didn't look like, I, I'm sure in the moment it was probably like a very intense situation that the people backstage were like, oh god what is happening now? Right before the show's supposed to go in the air, we get hit with this stuff. And you know, Tony's comments that he feared for his life, I don't know, I've been in I, I'm not a fighter or a tough guy by any stretch of the imagination but I've been in some very intense situations um, similar to in intensity to what was shown in the footage. I would never say that I feared for my life in those situations. Uh, me personally, I don't know. Um, that, that's my take on it. But ultimately the footage at this point in time after Punk told his side of the story, this whole thing just kind of came off like a nothing burger. And, uh, you know, didn't make AEW look good, didn't discredit Punk in any way, shape, or form, and it showed even more when the fans started chanting CM Punk after the footage was aired. So it's like, all right, so you've got AEW fans chanting for CM Punk now. It's like, yikes, this is bad. And they tried to make it work in the storyline by using it to add fuel to the fire of the Bucks and FTR match that's upcoming at the next pay-per-view. Um, it didn't accomplish that goal at all whatsoever. It just, it was just... I could have fed an entire crowded homeless shelter with perfect omelets made up of the egg that Tony had on his face by the end of the show because this was, this did not go the way that he probably thought it was going to go. And it's one of those things where it's like nobody tried to talk him out of this where, I, again, you watch the footage and I, I'm not saying Punk is a saint by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said, he clearly started it, but um, <coughs> there was nothing super super damning to the point where everybody's just all of a sudden going to turn on cm punk now that's that that didn't happen at all and again if you'd shown this seven months ago when he first got let go it's like oh okay you know makes sense showing it now um playing catch up after punk gave his side of the story it just it, it didn't do anything but make aew look bad and just highlighted the problem that tony khan is not um does not have full control over that locker room or whatever it is that's going on backstage. And I get it, Punk's not the easiest guy in the world to get along with, but it was, um, this is a situation that felt like it probably could have been avoided. And, you know, guys get into fights all the time in pro wrestling. I mean, famously, Batista and Booker T got into a, a fight. Jericho, against any and all best judgment, confronted Brock Lesnar backstage after his match with Orton. I would have fun with that, Chris. Um, but, uh, you know, that type of stuff happens in wrestling all the time. And what I saw in that footage was not... not something that would have shocked me in a professional wrestling environment, personally. And um, it made AEW look foolish. It made Tony Khan look foolish. It made the Bucks look foolish, even though it came out today that they didn't want to air the footage. This is just something that was presented to them and they tried to make it work the best they could. I don't know how true that is, but 
Uh, it's it's the story that's making the rounds right now. And then it came out that Tony was like, or AEW was like sending um, cease and desists and getting the footage pulled off of Twitter. Like, um, you, you know, there were comparison videos to Punk's interview and the footage, and apparently some of those videos were getting pulled from Twitter. I'm like, Tony, you're the one that leaked the footage. What are we doing here? What are we doing? What is going on? It, it's wild. And, you know, I get that they wanted to generate some interest for Dynamite and get, you know, an additional spark for Dynasty, which, you know, it's a lot harder to get excited for your pay-per-views when you have so many friggin' many of them. The thing that I criticized WWE for for years, they're just following suit. Let's add another pay-per-view. I'm like, or you could not do that and just go back to having only four pay-per-views a year. I don't know. One one weekly show and four pay-per-views a year was the perfect format for AEW and a, the best way to absorb that product. Now that it's like they're producing just as much, if not more, content than WWE and they don't have the built-in audience of WWE to justify that. So I'm just absolutely baffled by uh, by what they, they've done here. But in any case... Um, it was yeah. There, I'm sure it'll pop a rating. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people tuned in to see the footage. But Eric Bischoff said this on his podcast, one of his podcast episodes a while back, when they talked about the Ultimate Warrior debuting in WCW, where it's like, yeah, it popped a rating, and everybody that tuned in saw absolute dog shit. So it, it's gonna have like it's a short term gain, long term loss because a lot of people are gonna watch that. There's obvious disappointment from everybody commenting on it online. Um, it's not going to help AEW in the, the long run, and I can't believe somebody didn't pull Tony inside and tell him, it's like, you can't do this. This is this is not going to go the way you think it does. And again, I'm not saying CM Punk is a saint. I'm just saying that footage didn't show anything that is going to change people's minds into thinking that CM Punk is this rampaging monster that was tearing up the backstage area. If anything, the footage was... I'm sure it wasn't fun in the moment for anybody that was there, but... Compared to other fights I've seen, it was like, that was not that big a deal, personally. But, I don't know, huge misfire by Tony Khan. Huge misfire by AEW. And then the the hits kept on coming because they opened up the show with a, a match between Adam Copeland and Penta that went on for like half an hour. And it's a cold match. I'm like, guys, what are we doing here? There's just... Um, they have fully gotten on board with like... Star ratings and long matches and action is all we need, and it doesn't have to make any sense or have any rhyme or reason. And um, and then they did the Osprey promo where he responded to Triple H's comments, which I don't have a problem with responding to Triple H's comments because, you know, Triple H took the first shot, so if Will Osprey wants to retaliate, that's fine. Um, I don't think the manner in which he did it came off all that well. Uh, me personally, I, I just think it was, and again, it was another example of them directly reacting to WWE. It's like, you probably, I don't know, you, you probably could have done better. And then your main event was Samoa Joe and Dustin Rhodes, which was clearly a reference to what had happened in WrestleMania weekend. It just made it look like, I don't, I don't know, it looked like AEW was just trying to do anything to capitalize off the attention from WrestleMania and just failing at it in every step of the way. And that's no knock on Dustin. I love Dustin. I thought the match with Joe was pretty good. It's just that the timing was a little too convenient and it just kind of came off as, like, petty. And, and that's how I felt about it. And, oh, they're debuting wrestlers from stardom now. Uh, they I, I forget her name. They had the person come out with Mariah May. And I was like, guys, you... They need to stop, and this is, Tony Khan needs to, like, turn over creative control to somebody with a vision, because you can't just assume that every fan on the planet, every potential television, uh, every potential member of the television audience watches any and all wrestling. I watch a lot of wrestling. I have never watched Stardom, so I had absolutely no idea who that person was, and... It, uh, it, it just came off as awkward and hollow, and the way Excalibur reacted to it, and the way they were trying to sell it and present it, it was like, oh my god, this major star that we got, uh, that didn't sign with the WWE, and compare that to, uh, Julia, who, again, I've never seen before, I've heard her name before, but I've never seen her, um, they just, uh, as far as I know, I didn't watch the NXT show, but they just kind of debuted her sitting in the crowd and saying, oh, she's gonna be at the Performance Center, it's like, okay, so it's like, it's kind of a... 
I don't have to know who she is to understand. It's like, okay, new person is coming to the Performance Center, and that's it. Keep it simple and small scale and somewhat humble. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Or you can go the classic route and, I don't know, air vignettes? Explaining who these people are to people who don't watch Japanese women's wrestling, which is a lot of people here in America. Most people do not watch Japanese women's wrestling. But a lot of them don't watch Japanese wrestling, period. So it's just... Um, you're, you're like, you, they worked really hard just to pop a very small portion of the wrestling fan, but the hardcore wrestling fan base. And, um, that's not how you're going to win over casual viewers. And that's not how you're going to make new fans in my opinion. But, um, yeah, I think I'm going to take a break from AEW because this is just infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was there at the first Dynamite. I am not a guy who's trying to make money off of or get notoriety from bashing AEW. I don't want to bash AEW. I want, I've said it from the very beginning. It's like, look, I don't need AEW to beat WWE. I just need them to exist. And when you do stupid crap like this, it, it drives people away. And I think I need to take a, take a little break. I, I'll probably skip the next few shows, you know, all 45 of them that they have over the next, you know, you know, eight, eight or nine days or so skip collision and rampage and, and the next dynamite. And I'll tune into dynasty because I have a funny feeling because of that name that, uh, MJF is going to come back and God has he been sorely missed on that show. Um, but, and there's also a possibility that swerve might win the title. And I think that that you know, he should at this point, quite honestly, but, uh, he's one of the few things they have that's legitimately, uh, gotten over with the audience, but, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not good. It's not good for AEW. And again, they just, it, this was all self-inflicted wounds. They didn't have to do this. I, again, I get, you want to like generate some buzz and attention coming out of a huge weekend for WWE, but this going about it in a way that makes you look bad is not going to, yeah, you probably popped a rating for the night. I don't know what the numbers are, but it doesn't mean that it's, that's not going to translate to any kind of long-term success. And <coughs> again, if the footage had been super damning of CM Punk, it would have worked, but then you watch it and it's kind of a nothing burger and it's like, oh, well, okay, never mind. And, uh, you know, it's that footage that they aired didn't change anybody's mind one way or the other. If anything, you know, I think it probably won more people over to Punk's side, which is like, oh God, that's not good. Not good for AEW. Um, so that's the unfortunate situation of AEW right now. Like I said, I think I'm going to have to take a break because I just was like, they, they need to figure some stuff out. And again, I think that Tony Khan should turn control of creative over to somebody with a vision. I don't know who that would be. I don't know who you would get, but they, they need some help because they're struggling right now. Now, before I get, I get into some of the much happier news, specifically, uh, you know, WrestleMania 40 and all that goodness, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that happened WrestleMania weekend. Uh, there was the NXT show, Stand and Deliver, and Ring of Honor, Super Card of Honor. I did not bother with either show. Um, I don't care about NXT at this point. Uh, and I really do not care about Ring of Honor at this point. Who is, who is the audience for Ring of Honor in 2024? I gotta know, who is religiously watching Ring of Honor at this point in 2024? Um, because like I said, they basically took AEW Dark and put it behind a paywall. That's basically what ROH is at this point. But And NXT is, you know, nowhere near as exciting or interesting as it was, you know, a decade ago. Uh, when they really came on the scene, we're really providing something fresh and exciting. Now it's just, you know, WWE minor leagues. And I guess the people that watch NXT are the people that'll watch anything with the WWE branding on it. But, the, you know, WrestleMania was long enough to the point where I was like, I don't need to, you know, I, I don't need to watch an NXT show on top of that. And maybe this is part of the evil plan, like the evil planning of WWE, where they made WrestleMania so long so that any of the other shows that were happening that weekend, and you know, they added NXT to the mix as well, that any of the other shows happening that weekend would have a diminished intrigue and audience because who's going to go to other wrestling shows and then attend, you know, uh, eight hours of WrestleMania spread out over two days, plus an NXT show, plus the Hall of Fame, uh, plus SmackDown. It's just, uh, it, it almost feels like WWE is trying to monopolize the weekend and keep others from kind of, you know, aping off of their attention, but... In any case, I, I didn't bother with either show. Didn't care. Um, 
uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so, uh, it is what it is in that regard. A few years ago, maybe I would have watched NXT and ROH, but I just don't have that kind of time anymore. And WrestleMania is two nights. It's just too much to fully absorb. I did, however, watch the Hall of Fame, which, uh, of course, I watch every year. It's one of my favorite annual traditions that WWE does. Um, you know, and congratulations to all the Hall of Fame inductees, Bull Nakano, the U.S. Express, Thunderbolt Patterson, um... <laughs> Uh, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Muhammad Ali, uh, who's probably... This is probably the first year where The Outsider was probably the biggest name out of anyone in the class. Because, uh, uh, you know, some people commented on it. There wasn't really, like, a big headliner, um, former world champion, major star like there had been in previous years. But again, it's it's the Hall of Fame, and I, I just enjoy watching watching the past get honored. The big talking point, though, was Paul Heyman's speech. Um... Which, I, I didn't see the show live, and people walked away from it saying it was the greatest Hall of Fame speech of all time. Uh, I don't go into the Hall of Fame to, like, grade it or judge it like I would a standard wrestling show. To me, it's just a nice event to let the past stars, you know, be honored and say whatever they want to say and get it off their chest. And, uh, you know, let them bask in the spotlight for one last time. That's kind of how I see it. So, um, I, I don't really grade or judge Hall of Fame speeches in any kind of way, but to hear that kind of hype over Heyman's speech, I was like, oh, I should check that one out. So I watched it. I I disagree. I didn't think it was the greatest. Hall okay, and let me start this by saying my favorite Hall of Fame speeches, uh, the ones that hit me the hardest as far as like hitting me right in the feels were Bobby Heenan's uh, because he was super funny. He had been sick at that point, so his speech was not as... Um, uh, he had trouble speaking, obviously, but that humor and energy, the old Bobby the Brain Heenan uh, personality shined through despite that. And then, of course, there wasn't a dry eye in the house after he said, there's only one thing missing, I wish Monsoon was here, which is probably the hardest I've ever cried at anything wrestling related. Um, yes, I am counting WrestleMania 40 in, in that list. Um, and so that one really tugged at the heartstrings and Jake, the snake Roberts speech, I thought was very, very good. Um, that one, uh, you know, kind of an old broken down wrestler talking about his regrets, but then being appreciative of all the opportunities he, he'd been given and all the love and success that he'd had over his career and trying to make good out of a lot of the demons and uh, issues that he'd had over his lifetime. And so that one was a, uh, it was nice to see a guy like Jake get kind of a happy ending in that regard, that he was able to turn his life around and do that. So Jake's speech meant a lot to me as well. I also really liked Ultimate Warrior's speech because he went up there and we all expected him to go crazy and just bury everybody, but he didn't. And he just kind of gave a, a nice, normal, human, classic speech, a classy speech where people were allowed to be fans of the Ultimate Warrior again. And, and that one really worked. With Heyman's... I, he went on his usual tirades that I I've heard him go on all the time, where it's he he name drops a lot, he says a lot of things that it's like oh I wasn't supposed to say that because he did it at one night stand back in two thousand five, where it's like I'm gonna say all the things that I'm not supposed to say, Matt freaking Hardy, lol, and, and that stuff, and you know popping the uh, the dirt sheet readers and all that other s stuff, and I'm just like yeah you know it's. It's the usual Heyman song and dance that I have seen a million times. And I never, I, I'm not disrespecting Heyman. He deserves to go in the Hall of Fame. Great mind for the business. Had a vision for ECW that influenced wrestling forever in both good and bad ways. And um, I, I respect him as a talent as and as an artist. Um, personally, eh, there's some, some things he's done where I'm like, yeah, he's probably not the best human being on planet Earth, but how many people in wrestling are good human beings? <laughs> I, I made the joke a while back, you know, separating the art from the artist is something I've had to do a lot as a wrestling fan, so some of them are murderers, <laughs> but, so Heyman's not so bad on that list, but um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it, to me, his speech was just the same thing I've heard him say, you know, again, the same song and dance I've heard from Paul Heyman a lot, which is an energetic, cult-like, you know, cult leader-like speech that a lot of people pop for and get excited about. But I didn't feel like, and he said said as much in the speech. He doesn't know how to be himself or how to turn off the Paul Heyman persona. He he said as much in his speech. But this was like this felt like um, he was in character the whole time and just doing his usual Paul Heyman stuff, which is fine and entertaining in its own way. But as far as like 
some of the greatest, like, again, I, I, you know, Hall of Fame speeches of all time. I put, uh, I, I put Heenan and Jake's way, way, way up there. And I hold those in very high esteem. Because, again, they weren't, like, they weren't being characters in those moments. They were being themselves and being human. And they were very, um, very emotional speeches. And that resonated with me more than... Heyman doing his usual cult leader thing, which I never drank from the Paul Heyman Kool-Aid. Again, I respect a lot of things that he's done, and I respect his mind for the business and everything, but uh, I've never been a uh, a Paul Heyman ass kisser. So, you know, maybe it just didn't, uh, maybe, maybe it just didn't resonate with me because of that. I don't know. But <laughs> when people were saying it was the greatest Hall of Fame speech of all time, then I went back and watched it. I was like, meh, not for me. Not, not, not really. All right, and with all of the preamble stuff and all of the preludes, it's time to talk about WrestleMania 40, a huge milestone event for the WWE, the 40th WrestleMania, the first one without Vince McMahon involved in any way, shape, or form, which they made clear uh, during the course of that show. It's like, Vince has nothing to do with this. This is the Paul Levesque era, baby. And it's like, wow, they're really sweeping that man under the rug, huh? Uh, not in any of the history packages or video packages or anything. It's like, yeah, yeah. You know, I talk about, you know, Tony Khan having egg on their face. Like, with this whole Vince situation, like... And fortunately, the shows have been so good lately that they've kind of avoided a, a, a lot of backlash from the Vince stuff. But it's like, man, I, I can't imagine having the guy that built the company being, like, the most embarrassing figure in persona non grata... Uh, you know, on the 40th WrestleMania. It's kind of crazy to see how it all uh, all turned out. But um, I'm going to do something I don't normally do with pay-per-view reviews. I'm going to start with the main event because that was the most important thing. Um, well, the two main events. I'm going to talk about the two main events, Night One's tag match and Cody versus Roman for the title because those were the most important matches at this year's WrestleMania. And... Uh, uh, this was one of those cases where it was like, look, the rest of the matches on both nights could have been completely disposable, could have been completely horrible, and I wouldn't have cared because it was really just about that main story and that main angle. Fortunately, there were other good matches around, so it made the shows feel more complete, but I didn't care about anything else except for the Cody, Rock, Roman, and Seth stuff. So anything outside of that is just window dressing to me. So talking about those two matches... Um, First of all, the tag match uh, being 45 minutes long was a little, a little much. It was probably a hair too long. You probably could have cut out the the brawling through the crowd, and you would have been fine. You wouldn't have lost anything with that. But uh, the match felt big. It had a big fight feel for sure. A lot of star power involved. Rock, you know, I, I guess Cody is the default MVP of this WrestleMania for obvious reasons, but. Man, this WrestleMania would have really been lacking something had The Rock not been involved with it. He added so much to the buildup of this show. And then come bell time, you know, when they did this tag match, he did everything he could to make this match work. Um, and it, really, the whole thing was just a big star-studded spectacle designed to add a little extra heat to the, champ the title match on night two. And to that end, it succeeded. And it had the right finish with Rock going over Cody because it was like, okay, this does two things. One, it creates like that sense of doubt that Cody might not get the job done in night two, puts him in more of an underdog situation. And uh, if Cody wins, wink, wink, uh, it sets up a potential Rock versus Cody match for the title down the road. Um, which this past episode of Raw basically all but confirmed is going to happen, probably at around SummerSlam time. What did Rock hand Cody, by the way? Well, I guess we'll find out uh, when, it, when it's time to kick off the buildup for that match. But in any case, I thought the tag match was really, really good, did everything it needed to do, showcased all four talents effectively. Although Roman felt like the least important person in the match and he's the champion. So, yeah, but it, you know, whatever, hand-waving it now. It was um, a star-studded match. I had a big fight feel and made the next main event feel even more important. And that leads us into night two. Bloodline rules with Roman Reigns defending the undisputed... What did they call that friggin' thing? The undisputed WWE Universal Championship, I think I think is the full name. I don't know. I lost track. I'm, I'm confused, like, you know, 
with the women's title. It's like, there's the women's title and then the women's world title. I'm like, what's the... The naming conventions are just really stupid. But in any case, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, The uh, Bloodline Rules main event of Night 2 with Cody finally finishing the story, defeating Roman Reigns, and becoming the undisputed WWE Champion. A highly emotional moment. An epic and emotional match that felt like a, a full cinematic experience everything that a wrestlemania main event should feel like with a ton of window dressing and bells and whistles with like more run-ins than i could possibly count but in this situation it serviced the story perfectly because all of the bloodlines matches had turned into these like interference fests where you know roman always sneaks away with the win because of solo sokoa and jimmy uso and everything else and Every time a member of the Bloodline came out, when Jimmy came out, that brought out Jay. And so it was like Cody finally had an answer and a plan for all of Roman's BS. And, you know, when I talked about WrestleMania 21, or whenever I talk about WrestleMania 21, I always talk about how anticlimactic um, <sighs> Cena versus JBL was, where Cena just beat him, and that was it. And it was like, man, what a poor way to end JBL's run. What a poor way to start Cena's run. Because up to that point, any wrestler could have beat JBL, but he always had like a that interference or some kind of plan B, or he got lucky. All these other things that benefited him, and he goes into WrestleMania with no plan or anything, and Cena didn't have to overcome anything, he just beat him. It was very lackluster. So when you get to this match where Roman ultimately falls, he has all of his bloodline there. He has Solo, he has Jimmy, he has The Rock, and Cody has an answer to every single one of those. So when... Solo Sokoa came out, out comes John Cena, which is probably the only time I have ever popped for John Cena when he came out to save Cody. I was like, oh. Uh, so I was really digging what they were doing. And then when Rock came out, Undertaker came out. Now, a lot of people have said it would have been better if it was Austin. I agree, but Undertaker's not a bad substitute. So Austin would have been preferred in this situation, but Undertaker's not a bad substitute. And I was, I was willing to go along with it. And yeah, Seth Rollins come out in the shield garb. Would have been nice if John Moxley was there, <laughs> like to do the full shield thing. But whatever it is, what it is, came out in full sh- uh, shield gear. And uh, Roman had a choice to hit either Seth or Cody with the steel chair. He chose Seth, got rid of the chair, went for the spear, which set him up for his big fall. One other little touch. I liked it when. When they do the whole thing where they steal each other's finishers and Roman hit the crossroads and he got a two count and he said, that move sucks. Nobody ever gets beat with that. I'm like, ha ha, hubris is on the way. And sure enough, Cody put him away with three crossroads, got the win, um, creating a highly emotional, highly satisfying celebration where Cody's entire family, Brandy, his mother, everybody, and virtually all the top baby faces in WWE, uh, uh, Jey Uso was out there, Sammy, Kevin Owens, Randy Orton, who was... Cody Rhodes' mentor when he first came to the company. Um, Triple H and Bruce Pritchard came out. Um, and uh, uh, John Cena was out there. The announcers were out there. Samantha Irvin delivered her uh, Howard Finkel moment where she got to announce the new champion, but her voice cracked because she was so emotional, which uh, that's going to make that moment even more historic. The fact that she she got swept up in the emotion of everything. So... Uh, yeah, that was all stellar, amazing, everything that you want out of a WrestleMania moment and match. Um, all of it very, very well done, and it concluded Roman Reigns' historic championship reign, which I think got to 1,316 days. Um, and it's funny, I saw a tweet online asking, it's like, where were you in your life when Roman Reigns' title reign started? I'm like, I was trapped inside, living alone as a bachelor, uh thanks to the COVID lockdowns, uh, cause it was still like, everything was still shut down at the point when, when Roman won the title, I was still kind of shut down and trapped inside cause I had nowhere to go. And I started working on my book. Um, now that Roman's reign has ended, I am now married living in a house. I'm a father and I'm a published author. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that happened in between when Roman's reign uh, started and when it ended. So that tells you how long this thing went. Um, uh, if I had to sum up Roman's reign, I would say overall, obviously very successful. Actually, the ending to this show was so good. And again, thank God for The Rock because he injected so much energy into all of this. But um, the ending to this was so well done and so good that it kind of validated WrestleMania 39, where a lot of us, myself included, thought WWE had dropped the ball. 
Um, but now that we got this ending, it kind of makes 39 worth it and better in retrospect. So this is probably the closest we've gotten to having two great manias in a row. I don't think that's ever happened. I'm trying to think back. Has there ever been great back-to-back -back WrestleManias? Uh, not, not that I can recall off the top of my head, but, um, but, um, yeah, Roman's reign, I would, I would make the statement that his reign was like a TV show that started off with promise, got better, got amazing as time went on and then kind of hit a wall and then lessened in quality in like the last season or something. You're going, Oh no, what's going on? And then in the last three or four episodes, it came alive and they delivered and stuck the landing for the finish. So it's like, all right, the last season was a little wonky, but at least they stuck the landing. I've heard some people describe Mad Men that way, where it's like, great show, last season, eh, but the finale stuck the landing, so we were all good. So yeah, Roman Reigns' title reign is like Mad Men. I will go there. <laughs> I, will, I will make that comparison. Better than Game of Thrones would just completely shit the bed with the final season and the finale, but... Uh, yeah, overall a success, um, a great ending to a historic championship reign, and a fantastic crowning of a new champion with one of the best endings in WrestleMania history. So the two main events from both nights and servicing that story and giving Cody that big, awesome, once-in-a-lifetime championship victory, all of that was great and made WrestleMania 40 completely worth it. And an excellent experience over the course of two nights. Uh, the rest of the cards, um, there were some good matches there. And there was some stuff I enjoyed. It was generally, uh, again, we can have the debate whether or not WrestleMania should be one night or two nights. Um, I'm of the mindset, it's like, look, in a perfect world, WrestleMania would be one four-night show. But if the matches are going to keep going this long... And I, I would much rather have a two-night show that's, you know, two, three to four-hour shows instead of one seven to eight-hour show. Because some of those WrestleManias from uh, 32 to 35, especially, those shows were way, way too, like, like soul-suckingly long, like, to the point of absurdity. And um, I think splitting it up into two nights... It's worked, you know, 37 was good. 36 was the COVID mania, so that almost doesn't count. But 37 was good. I thought 38 was good. 39 was very good up until the last five minutes. And 40 was very good. So it's like, all right, I mean, the two-night format, they're making it work. It's it's going pretty well. So, yeah, uh, that's all I have to say. The main events for WrestleMania were amazing. But let me go over the rest of the cards. Starting with night one, um... Now, again, this didn't come across on TV because I wasn't there, but apparently it was really cold and really windy that night. So I don't know if that affected some of the performances. It definitely seemed to take the life out of the crowd a little bit. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's the risky run when you do outdoor stadiums where, you know, the weather, inclement weather becomes a factor uh, in, in the production and something you have to account for, especially you know, this time of year where we're entering, exiting winter and entering spring. It's still early spring, so it's still a little cold. And, you know, us East Coasters, <laughs> we, uh, we we don't always cooperate when you do a big show in a stadium. So, um, but yeah, it, um, yeah, so I don't know if that had any kind of an impact on the crowd or the performers or whatever. But uh, in any case, uh, some of the matches on night one seemed to falter a little bit. I don't know if that was why, but... Uh, we started off with Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch, with Rhea successfully defending the world women's title. You know, it was easier when there was Raw and SmackDown <laughs> delineation. Now it's like, one's the WWE and one's the world, but they're both WWE. I don't know anymore. I The naming conventions are stupid. But anyway, uh, Rhea Ripley successfully defended the women's world title against Becky Lynch. Uh, I thought the match was solid. I thought the spot they did with Becky, like, perched up on Rhea's shoulders, and then they flipped out of the ring and Rhea landed on her feet. Uh, to deliver the electric chair. I thought that was pretty cool and memorable. Um, the match never, like, it, it didn't have the energy or the urgency of a major title match to me, and it didn't feel, like, grand or epic, but it was solid and generally good, and I think it was a nice win for Rhea Ripley. So, you know, good, solid opener for night one, so no complaints there. Um, then we got the ladder match, which uh, I'm gonna beat this broken record into the ground, um... I don't like multi-person ladder matches. I've gotten sick of them. Even when I go back and watch the classics, like from like WrestleMania 2000 and WrestleMania X7, I, I it's hard for me to get invested in them because I've seen these matches so warily often 
that these big spots and bodies flying all over the place and this massive spot fest that they do just leaves no impression on me at all whatsoever. So it's like, it didn't matter who was in the match. It doesn't matter what they're doing or how they're doing it or whatever. It's just a mindless car wreck of a match where people just do spots. Um, for the entire duration of the bout. Um, I don't like that they broke up the, the two sets of tag titles. I liked having just one set of tag champions. It felt a lot bigger and better when the Usos had them and uh, made Sammy and Kevin Owens' victory feel better because there was no... There's only one set of tag champions, so they're harder to get and it feels more special. Uh, that's how I feel about it personally. So I wasn't a fan of them splitting up the tag titles. Uh, the teams involved in this, I guess I should mention them, uh, A-Town Down Under... Uh, the Awesome Truth, The Judgment Day, lost both sets of tag titles, kind of doing the Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 2000 thing where they lost both their tag titles without getting pinned. Uh, DIY, The New Day, and The New Catch Republic. Um, A-Town Down Under won the SmackDown tag titles, and The Awesome Truth won the Raw Tag Team Championship. So at least The Awesome Truth came out of this with, with some silver, not gold, but silver. They need to change the designs of those belts because they're horrible. But, um, uh, yeah, you know, for all the big spots in this match, the the best thing and the most memorable part about the entire thing were R-Truth's antics where he acted like this was a regular tag match and got the hot tag. It was just perfectly on brand for his goofiness and his weirdness. And I'm like, oh, that was fun. I enjoyed that. Uh, I'm glad that Miz and Truth won at least one set of the tag titles because they were the best thing heading into this match. But other than that, uh, there wasn't a whole lot here, and I wasn't that excited about it. So, you know, it's like, it's another pay-per-view, another multi-person car wreck ladder match that will be quickly forgotten within a couple of weeks. Uh, next up, we had Rey Mysterio and Andrade, not Dragon Lee, who was originally announced as the partner, but Andrade, uh, defeating Santos Escobar and Dirty Dom Mysterio. This match was... Okay, I guess, but there were with the LWO and uh, Santos's group, Legato, something or other, I forget the name. Um, uh, with all those bodies flying around and Electro Lopez and Zelina Vega going at it, and then all both factions going at it, and then a senseless run in from uh, uh, Kel Kelsey and Lane, the Philadelphia Eagle linemen. Um, I get involving them because they were in Philly and it would have popped the crowd. It just felt so random for them to pop up in this match of all matches when there was no real, like, storyline purpose for them being there. They probably would have fit better in the street fight in night two, where, which also crammed uh, a few other special guests in there. I don't know. But uh, that felt random. Uh, the match overall, like, didn't really kick into high gear or anything. It didn't feel as personally charged as Ray and Dom did the year before. It was just kind of a, kind of, kind of an okay-ish tag match with a bunch of bodies flying around, and that was pretty much it. Uh, un unfortunate, because Ray and Dom did such great work last year, and this one just kind of felt like a, a an inferior sequel. But uh, it is what it is. Uh, then we got probably the most disappointing match on night one, uh, Jimmy and Jey Uso, which was not a good match. Uh, very awkwardly paced, very... Um, you know, the story they were trying to tell in the ring just didn't seem to click. It just felt like something was off the entire match, and I think I know what it was. Uh, Jimmy and Jay are twin brothers, and their wrestling styles are almost identical to each other. Uh, so not only do they look similar in appearance, but they also wrestle very similarly. And without that contrast, I think it was hard for them to tell a very compelling story because you did, you could, it was hard to get a sense of who the heel was and who the face was. Just watching it blind, like ignoring the storyline and everything else surrounding it, and you just... Tune in, flip the TV on, and watch it blind. You couldn't instantly pick up who the heel was and who the face was. And because they both looked the same, so everything just kind of uh, got overshadowed by the fact that the two brothers are a little too similar to each other. And that element didn't really play into the story that they were telling either. So it was uh, just kind of an awkward plotting match that unfortunately failed to deliver because it was one of the best built matches on this show and I was excited when they signed it but uh, ultimately it, it really fell short of expectations and like I said it was the most disappointing match of the two shows by far um, but it is what it is uh, then we got the six women tag Jade Cargill, Bianca Belair and Naomi defeating Damage Control Dakota Kai, Asuka and Kairi Sane uh, this match was short to the point and was largely designed to make Jade Cargill look like a star. Jade Cargill has a 10 out of 10 look 
looks like a superstar and needs to be put into situations that hide her weaknesses and accentuate her positives. And this match did that effectively well. So uh, to that end, the match worked. It wasn't anything special, not a match of the year candidate or anything like that, but uh, it was designed to make Jade look co cool and she looked cool. Uh, then the next night on Raw, they had her, or well, the next Monday on Raw, they had her murder Chelsea Green in 10 seconds. That made her look cool, dominant, which is how she should look. She's kind of a female Sid Vicious. And she's got to be made to look strong. And having her, you know, do back and forth 20-minute matches is not going to do that. So I think right now they're presenting Jade effectively. And uh, hopefully she grows a little bit more as an in-ring performer because there is a lot of upside to her. Uh, then we got the Intercontinental title match between Sami Zayn and Gunther. I loved, and this is one of the things that WWE has been doing really well lately. And I, I think this is The Rock's influence, uh, bringing some of that Hollywood over to WWE. But the way they shoot things now is so much better than it has been in years. Um, and this single shot, continuous shot, showing Sami Zayn uh, greeting his family backstage, them wishing him luck, and then he comes across... Uh, Kevin Owens, when he walks up that little entry ramp there, and it's all done in one continuous shot, all of that was done really, really well, and it looked great. And it's little things like this that are making the WWE programming a lot more exciting to watch. So that was really cool to see. But Sami Zayn uh, defeated Gunther, dethroning the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time in what was a pretty damn good match. Uh, I felt like parts of it got a little repetitive, like they showed Gunther like taunting Sami Zayn's wife at ringside, um, and which is fine, but they did it like three or four times, and it just go uh, like, okay, guys, you only need to do it once or twice to really get the point across. And there are a few other things that they did that got a little repetitive, but overall, I think the underdog story was effectively told. You had the big unbeatable monster in Gunther beating down Sami continuously. He persevered, came through and won the Intercontinental Championship. And Sami's got a nice little thing going at Mania where he uh, ends the historic record-setting reigns because the year before he ended the Usos tag team title reign, which was the longest tag team title reign in company history. And now he's ended the longest IC title reign in company history. So he's got a bit of a knack for uh, overthrowing the long-term champions. But uh, yeah, this was solid, perfectly well done. Probably the best match of the undercard for night one. And then, of course, there was the tag match, which I already put over, which was worth the price of admission and, uh, you know, the star attraction of night one and absolutely worth it uh, for everything that they did. But let's move on to night two. <clears throat> uh, Drew McIntyre defeated Seth freaking Rollins to become the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, again, the naming conventions are weird. But um, Drew McIntyre won the title. I, I like that the match wasn't that long. I like that... Um, Drew took advantage of the fact that Seth had been beaten down and injured the night before in the tag match. And uh, Seth was burning the candle at both ends, took his eye off the ball, and got beat by Drew McIntyre. Match itself, I wasn't that big a fan of because they were just spamming finishers the whole time. And that gets very annoying to me after a while because it just looks like a video game. Um in that regard, but I liked the re I didn't like the match that much, but I liked the result. I thought Drew winning was very good, and then he had the little interaction with Punk after the match where he taunted him, and then Punk beat him up, which set him up for Damian Priest to finally cash in the Money in the Bank and win the World Heavyweight title. Um, nice surprise there. Uh, it was something that was in the back of my mind and something I thought they might do, and they did it here, and it adds a little bit more fuel to the fire for Drew McIntyre, who has been great lately. I've never been the biggest Drew McIntyre fan, but... This DM hunk stuff and everything that he's doing on social media is absolute gold. And, um, and you know, this this effectively, like I said, it adds more fuel to the fire to this situation with Punk. So I think there's some really good stuff here. Um, so, yeah, uh, not the biggest fan of the match. But as far as storyline potential coming out of the match, I think there's a lot of good stuff here. So uh, this was overall pretty effective. And, again, I liked that the match wasn't that long, which was nice. Uh, then we got the Philadelphia Street Fight, the Pride, Bobby Lashley, Angelo Dawkins, and Montez Ford with BFAB defeating the Final Testament, Karrion Cross, Akam, and Razor. Every time I see their names, the Authors of Pain, Akam, and Razor, I think of SWAT Cats, T-Bone, and Razor. I don't know why. Uh, that's just me. But uh, they had Scarlett and Paul Ellering in their corner. We also had Snoop Dogg on commentary and special guest referee Bubba Ray Dudley uh, to uh, officiate over the proceedings. He was anything but... A, uh, anything but a, an impartial referee as he basically helped the babyfaces win. Um, this match, I, of all the matches at this year's WrestleMania, this is probably the one I cared about the least going into it. Um, I think the Final Testament is a terrible idea. It's a, 
the wrestling business, and Eric talked about this on our Weekday Warriors episode, but the wrestling business is just too filled with gothic spooky stables. We've got the House of Black in AEW. We had the Dark Order, which is still there for some reason. And then in WWE, we have the Judgment Day. And it's just like, and TNA, you know, flirted with the idea of having a couple. It's like, how many spooky groups do we need? And it's like, look, none of you are going to be as scary as the Ministry of Darkness unless you go the extra mile. And look, we can talk about the better workers in Judgment Day in the Final Testament than most of the Ministry of Darkness outside of Undertaker, um, probably. But... They were much scarier and they felt like a satanic cult. The rest of them just feel like they went to Party City and just decided to play goth for a day. And it's, I, I don't know, it's just, it's an idea that's being done way too much. And Final Testament, if the Judgment Day, because I said this um, when they first showed up, if they were a dollar store version of the Ministry of Darkness, the Final Testament is the dollar store version of the dollar store version of the Ministry, the ministry of Darkness. And again, that's not a knock on any of the talents. I just... I don't like the concept or anything. But anyway, uh, you get into this match. Largely uninteresting, except for the window dressing around it, which is having the two women fight was fun. Scarlet looks hot as hell. And, uh, you know, her interaction with B-Fab where they went to the table was fun. Um, Bubba Ray is the referee and doing all the Dudley Boy stuff with the pride. Added a little bit of fun to it. And Snoop Dogg on commentary was hilarious. <laughs> I, I, he made a Yogi Bear reference. Like, hey, boo boo, get the table or something like that. And I was like, he's like, he's probably high because it's Snoop Dogg. And he's just goofing on it and having fun. It's like, hey, this is making the match better than it would be otherwise. So there was some fun to be had here. The Pride won, thank God, because Final Testament has no long-term potential in my opinion. And they got out of what was looking like a bad situation with this match, and they got out of it relatively unscathed. With a, you know, There was some fun to be had here. So uh, no complaints for the most part. Uh, then we got LA Knight versus AJ Styles. I thought this match was pretty damn good. Uh, and it was a nice win for LA Knight. Uh, this is one of the few matches that didn't have a title involved or some kind of stipulation. It was just a normal grudge match, which I'm completely okay with that because there's too many titles in the WWE and wrestling in general. But um, yeah, so it was nice to just get a normal match. And it was solid. It was just a good, really good back and forth, hard hitting match with LA Knight getting the win. Uh, nothing complicated, easy peasy. Nice to see LA Knight was mad over and it was nice to see him get rewarded with a victory at WrestleMania, his first WrestleMania. So this was all good, no complaints. Then we got uh, Logan Paul with I Show Speed in his corner. I have I've absolutely no idea who that is. I'm an old man yelling at this guy. So don't know. I'm sure, again, as Eric said on the Weekday Warriors episode, I'm sure the kids know who he is, but not me. So uh, fine. Uh, so Logan Paul successfully defended the United States title against Kevin Owens and Randy Orton in another really good match from Logan Paul. Good, good stuff here with some really cool counters to a lot of the finishers. And Logan being the slimy heel that gets, um, that got double teamed for a good portion of the match from the two baby faces. Uh, this was all good. I'm glad that Kevin Owens brought, uh, he brought the KO Mania shirt back and he restarted at WrestleMania 7 because last year we didn't get a 7 because they did the WrestleZania shirt. And, which was nice, but I missed the KO shirt. So it's nice that we got one for 7. So that was cool. Um... And yeah, a lot of good action here. I wasn't a big fan of Randy Orton kicking out of a brass knuckle shot because that should be death. And, uh, you know, Orton's not like a superhero type, like a Sting or an Undertaker or Goldberg or that type. Randy Orton, that you know, he gets hit with brass knucks. That should have knocked him out, I feel like. And, you know, it's a triple threat match. They could have just had Kevin Owens break up the pin. So I wasn't a fan of, you know, him kicking out of that. But other than that, uh, generally thought it was a really entertaining match with Logan Paul getting the win as predicted because uh, he's going to have to have a showdown with LA Knight at some point. So I think doing that match for the U.S. title would be a lot of fun. So yeah, Logan Paul, he's still good. Still good. You know, we can we can hate on that. I actually, I think he's kind of a douchebag in real life. But hey, as a performer, he's a natural heel and he's got, he's got a knack for this. So I say keep the gravy train rolling in that regard. Um, as for the Prime stuff, uh, you know, the Prime hydration drink stuff or whatever, I don't mind them buying ad space on the WWE ring mats. I actually think, you know, that's fairly common in MMA and things like that. It's like, okay, fine, whatever, don't care. But um, I encourage everyone to not buy Prime <laughs> or any of those fancy hydration drinks or anything. like. You know, the fans started chanting Gatorade at one point. Um, Gatorade is also not the best. You're better off with water. Always stick with water. Speaking as somebody who works out quite a bit and, um, 
you know, I used to drink a lot of those, and not Prime, but I used to drink Gatorade a lot when I was younger, and um, there's just a bunch of excess stuff in it that your body just doesn't need, and you're better off with just nice, good old-fashioned H2O. Uh, that's my health advice for the day. Drink water. Always drink water. Don't get caught up in the promotion of like this type of shit right here. And that's, yeah, again, they want to have a partnership with WWE, fine. But um, I just, uh, I encourage people not to drink it. Just drink water. You're better off with that. So uh, moving on from there, we had Bailey defeating EO Sky to become the WWE, again, these names of these titles, the WWE Women's Champion, um, ending EO Sky's long run of over 200 days and getting revenge on damage control. Uh, I thought the match was good. Uh, the problem, the biggest issue I had with it was Bailey's knee injury, where at some point she was selling it really well to the point where it's like, oh God, is she really hurt? But then she would run the ropes and climb up the top rope as if there was nothing wrong with her and do moves as if there was nothing wrong with her. And she went back and forth between the two. And it's like, so she hurt or not? Like this injury didn't really mean a whole heck of a lot, but it was satisfying to see Bailey win the title. I would have liked damage control to play some kind of a role in this match and try to interfere on EO's behalf just to add that little wrinkle in the story where, you know, Bailey was trying to take down the Frankenstein monster that she created. They didn't do that, and it's like, okay, fine. And I heard some people complaining that this match should have main evented night one. Absolutely not. The tag match needed to main event night one. If you want to get into that overly traditional, the Royal Rumble winner and the title match should be the main event. If you get into that mindset... That's how you get WrestleMania 18. That's how you get WrestleMania 25 where you have a shitball main event that nobody cares about because they said, it's got to be the title match. It's got to have the Royal Rumble winner in it and all that jazz. And it's like, no, you don't. You, you, it should be whatever the fans are most excited to see. And that was Hogan Rock at 18. That was Undertaker and Shawn Michaels at 25. And, you know, going against, you know, fairly common sense, it's like, what's the most exciting match? You close with that. Um, and the tag match was the most exciting match. And this wasn't even the most exciting match of the undercard. Like I said, I, I preferred the U.S. title over this. I preferred um, <laughs> the IC title over this. I preferred... I think I preferred Becky and Rhea over this, quite honestly. And it's... Um, this would not have done well in a main event spot. I think uh, having it where it was was a lot better for them, and having them in a main event spot would have set them up for failure. That's not a knock on either woman. That's, uh, you know, EO Sky is an amazing athlete and a great performer, and Bailey, uh, you know, the last, you know, she, I think she's the last one of the four horsewomen to win a title at WrestleMania, if I have my history right, but... Um, yeah, the match was good. Uh, nice, satisfying title win. And th man, there were a lot of title changes at this Mania where, like, historic title runs came to an end. It made me nervous for Cody because it was like, man, Bailey won, Gunther's reign ended. It, it was looking like, it's like, are they, like, front lashing with all of the title changes to kind of soften the blow of Cody's uh, eventual defeat. But fortunately, they didn't do that, and we got a great main event out of it. So, WrestleMania 40 overall was a... Um, again, it was the it was the Cody Rhodes story that made the entire weekend work. I thought both main events were very, very good at servicing and telling that story to, to its fruition. All of that was great. Um, mm. uh, the undercard, mostly solid, mostly good. It's all it needed to be. And that's fine. Both shows were easy to watch, generally entertaining, and then ended on big highs. So, uh, yeah, that's good old-fashioned classic wrestling done really, really well. And that's what WrestleMania 40 did. It felt big, it delivered where it needed to, and was overall a really good time. So WrestleMania 40 gets a major thumbs up from me. And now the wrestling talk is over, and it's time for me to move from one of my passions to another, and that is... Godzilla. The latest Godzilla film was released almost two weeks ago, and I am just getting to it now because life has been crazy, and it is what it is. So, Godzilla X Kong The New Empire. What did I think of this film? Um, it's the latest entry in the MonsterVerse film, and the second Godzilla movie we've gotten in a few months, with Minus One being released late last year. What did I think of Godzilla X Kong The New Empire? I thought it was okay. It was a big slice of completely fine. Um, I think it's the weakest of the MonsterVerse films. Um, I think that um, it, it succeeds in a very baseline, surface-level way where it's like, if you're just in it for the monsters and literally nothing else, this film has got you covered. It did not false advertise. It is not trying to be anything more than what was promised to us. It is just a straight-up monster spectacle. 
And if that's what you like, and if you're a fan of that stuff like me, you'll have a good time at the movie theater. So yeah, it's a completely okay, serviceable, entertaining film. The definition of a popcorn film. Um, now it's, uh, and it, it's happened already. It's going to get unfavorably compared to Minus One, uh, which is understandable because the two films were released so close to each other. Um, I, I do think it is kind of comparing apples and oranges though, because Minus One is a, you know, arguably the best Godzilla movie ever made. And is a serious, grounded, very human drama that just happens to have a nuclear dinosaur in it. And it's very effective and very well done. And it's an excellent, dramatic film. But as I've said before, Godzilla, one of the keys to his longevity has been his versatility, where he can be a, it can be a serious drama. The original film was that. The original film was also kind of a horror movie. But Godzilla's also been a screwball, over-the-top, you know um, wild experience. And, uh, you know, it's leaned very heavily into spectacle. And I wrote an entire book about a two volume book about the subject of how, you know, these films have essentially became like boxing prize fights with giant monsters. And that's how they were sold. And was all about being, uh, being a, a wild over the top spectacle. And if you look at the Showa era films and the Millennium era films and a little bit of the Hisei films as well. Uh, they also leaned into that and that is actually more the norm than the more dramatic films like uh, Godzilla 54, The Return of Godzilla in 84, Shin Godzilla, and of course Minus One. So um, I think there's room for both. I think it's great that we're getting both. We actually exist at a time where Japan's making the dramatic ones and America's making the popcorn entertainment ones that are fun and give us all that good monster destruction carnage that we all love so much. And I think getting all of that and covering the full spectrum of God, the Godzilla experience and happening from two different studios, I think it's great. So I'm completely okay with that. And um, minus one, whether it existed or not, would not color my opinions of this film at all whatsoever. I just kind of uh, view them as separate entities and that just happen to star the same character. And that's kind of how I look at it. But uh, there are things that this film could have done to make the monster spectacle even grander. And I think there were some missed opportunities. Again, just my opinion. But um, what did I like about the film? Well, like I said, the monsters are the stars. Uh, a lot of people said Godzilla get, didn't get to do all that much in the film. It's like, yeah, you know, he goes around, he trashes Rome, attacks France, attacks a nuclear power plant, kills two monsters all before the final battle. It's like, he's he doesn't have much of a story. He's just, his entire purpose is to just prepare for the final battle. And um, to that end, he has a fairly consistent presence throughout the film. It's just he's not involved in the main story, which is, that can be a complaint either way. You know, a lot of the Showa era films, especially when Godzilla's the hero, kind of leave him out of the action until like the final third of the film where he's the last line of defense. And that's kind of what this film did. So I'm okay with that. It didn't really bother me that much. Um, and we do get to see Godzilla do some cool things. So I'm okay with it. But um, like I said, if you enjoy Monster Spectacle, this film definitely has you covered. And I really appreciated that they added new monsters to the roster with new enemies for Godzilla and Kong. The Scar King, spelled S-K-A-R King, which I'm sure that was done to avoid uh, a phone call from Disney's lawyers. <laughs> if I were a betting man, that's probably why they did that. But uh, the Scar King and a poor unfortunate titan that's under his control the giant ice breathing dinosaur shimo who is treated like an abused circus elephant by uh the scar king who's able to control her with this uh weird crystal that's on the end of his whip i was a little confused at how that worked um i like that they tried to tell a lot of the story with the monsters visually and just let their facial expressions and their personalities kind of give us the exposition that we needed to make things make sense i thought suko was a very expressive little thing and kong's personality and what he was thinking and feeling you could sense it just by looking at him and all that was great but that was one thing where it's like how does the crystal work does it only work on shimo or can it work on other monsters and if this is his like big weapon to control shimo why would he attach it to the end of a long weapon i know it's weird to ascribe human logic to a giant ape but uh you know whatever but uh, yeah, Scar King is the main villain of the film, this evil, basically an evil Kong that wants to uh, take over the entire world, Hollow Earth and the surface world uh, combined. And um, I do like that they took the effort to actually create new enemies because, uh, you know, and I talk about this in my book, but one of the elements of the Godzilla series that got me into it was 
okay, what's he going to fight next? Like, what crazy thing is he going to fight next? And the Showa series provided that with one new crazy opponent after another. The Hisei series continued that tradition with Mecha Ghidorah, Biolanti, Batra, Space Godzilla, Destroyer, all that fun stuff. Uh, but then you get to the Millennium Era films, and they kind of got away from using new monsters. Yes, we got Orga. Yes, we got Mega Gearus, but they weren't the greatest. And um, and then they went back to, okay, Mothra, Ghidorah, Mecha Godzilla. Those are the ones we use. And um, I don't know. It's kind of like, and look, I love those monsters, and it's great to have them back whenever they do show up. But at the same time, it's like, where's the new monsters? Where's the growing roster? Because it was always about growing the roster and giving Godzilla new obstacles. And uh, that's something that the series kind of moved away from, unfortunately. Uh, the 2014 film gave us the Mudos, which are cool. But then they went right, you know, all the other movies either went to standalone films like Minus One and Shin Godzilla, where it's just Godzilla. And, um, and, uh, bringing back the old standbys of Ghidorah, Mothra, and Mecha Godzilla, you know, uh, as per usual. So now it's like we're finally getting new monsters. It's like, thank you. Here we go. This is what I've been looking for. So we get an evil Kong for. Godzilla and Kong to beat up on and a giant ice breathing dinosaur, which is like perfect. That's exactly what I like to see. Okay. So that was cool. Um, and I, I, again, I think generally the monster action was pretty well done through most of the film. Although I do have a couple of complaints that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, uh, the human, the humans in this movie exist for the sole purpose of providing exposition and no other reason. I think we're actually getting closer and closer to a point where, um, where we may get like a Godzilla or a Kong movie where there's little to no humans in it and almost no dialogue. I think we're getting closer and closer to that where they're really going to let the monsters kind of carry the story and go for no dialogue driven because there were long sequences with the monsters here where it's just them interacting. And uh, those were the best parts of the movie because no one cares about the people. And when they tried to inject like a little bit of human drama with where's Gia going to end up? Is she going to stay in the hollow earth? Or is she going to go back with her adoptive mom? And I'm sitting there like, no one cares. No, nobody cares. And this whole thing rings hollow. Just go back to Kong and the mini Kong and, and Scar King and Shimo and Godzilla and all that other fun stuff that we're here for. And, um, and yeah, like I said, the monsters delivered, you get a lot of really cool action sequences. I mean, I think the big highlight for a lot of people was the Godzilla Kong fight in Egypt, which was so much fun. Uh, Godzilla actually suplexed Kong and got to show off some, some of his savage badassery while they destroyed the pyramids of Egypt, which was pretty fun. Uh, the final battle is a lot of fun too, with the anti-gravity fight and the big battle in Rio de Janeiro, which I believe was attacked by Behemoth in Godzilla King of the Monsters, so that city seems to be bad luck in this universe. But um, in any case, what did I not like about the film? Well, in comparison to the other MonsterVerse films, uh, the 2014 film Skull Island, Godzilla King of the Monsters, and Godzilla vs. Kong, um, I felt like this movie offered a little bit less than what the other MonsterVerse films did. For the 2014 film, I love the atmosphere and I love the pacing. And I love how they made the monsters really feel larger than life. Um, Skull Island, I like the savage setting and the all-star cast and uh, just how violent and gritty the film was. And it was nice to see Kong like break out of his usual routine of getting kidnapped, brought to, you know, brought to America and then knocked off a, a tall building. It was nice to kind of break Kong out of that mold a little bit. Um, and Godzilla, King of the Monsters, uh, again, it brought back a lot of the old co-stars and put them in an American movie for the first time, which was historic and very exciting. And there was a lot of spectacle to be had with that. And a lot of like really exploring the lore and the personalities of the monsters and really expand on that. And that was also fun to see. And uh, Godzilla vs. Kong has probably the best fight scenes in the MonsterVerse still. I would even say that. And it was the big rematch that we all wanted. And uh, seeing Godzilla and Kong together felt like a big deal. And then you got the added bonus of Mechagodzilla, which was cool. Uh, unfortunately... Once you've done Kong and Godzilla before, the genie's kind of out of the bottle now, and so this film kind of feels less special as a result, and I don't think it has anything compensating for it. Um, and none of the traits that made the other MonsterVerse films work so well. This one succeeds on purely a surface-level basic entertainment of watching monsters go boom. And to that end, the movie works just fine, but there's not a whole lot else other than that. And uh, even, um, you know, looking at the film, there are things they could have done to kind of, even as a silly monster spectacle, there are things they could have done to make certain things land a little bit better. Um, 
you know, they bring in the mini Kong and he has like a relationship with Kong, but I thought it was a missed opportunity to not have that little Suko interact with Godzilla at all. I feel like that was a missed opportunity for something either comedic or, or really fun just to have Godzilla interact with this tiny little Kong that he could kill in an instant. Um, we did get the funny moment where Kong picked up Suko and started using him as a bat, which was hilarious, but uh, one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Um, so that was fun, but <coughs> uh, we also had a moment where the Scar King took Kong's axe, which by this point has become kind of an iconic weapon for Kong, and Scar King taking that should have hit a little bit harder, but it felt it went by so fast that I barely remembered that Kong lost his axe. Um, both Godzilla and Kong get upgrades this time around. Godzilla famously getting the magenta coloring uh, added energy and Kong getting the beast glove. Uh, this was done to sell toys. Uh, you can't convince me otherwise. I said the same thing in Force Awakens when C-3PO got the red arm. It's like, why does C-3PO have a red arm? To sell toys. That's why, to sell new toys. And if he looks exactly the same as he did before, you're not going to sell as many new toys. And that was the thought behind it. Nobody can convince me otherwise. And same principle here where it's like, why is Godzilla glowing pink now? And why does uh, Kong have a metal glove? To sell more toys. That's why. But... And that's fine. I'm completely okay with that. But I would have liked a better explanation for how and why they got those powers because Godzilla spends the entire movie just leveling up to prepare for the final battle. And it would have been, I think it would have been more effective if Scar King and Shimo defeated Godzilla earlier in the film and then Godzilla goes on a like, okay, I need to prepare for the rematch. Kind of a Rocky Three style thing where he prepares himself for the ultimate rematch. Or even Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla where he gets beat in the first encounter and then he goes off to kind of heal up and get struck by lightning to get additional powers to prepare him for the for the eventual rematch so uh, i i think that would have played a little bit better if if scar king and shimo were established as a threat to godzilla and i'll elaborate on that in a little bit uh kong got frostbite from shimo and that's the explanation for how he got the beast glove um which is again fine i would have it felt a little sudden how it was introduced and it would have been nice if we actually got to see them actually constructing the thing and having to go get it. And, but then again, that would have made the film longer. And, um, I actually liked that the film was kind of short. Like at that, I think from start to, to about the start of the end credits, the whole thing is about an hour 45, which is a nice sweet spot. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. But it didn't waste our time and pretty much just got, got to it. But it would have been nice if there was something a little bit more going on with the beast glove. And, um, uh, we got Mothra uh, in the film, which was a nice surprise that was unfortunately spoiled for me before I saw the film. Uh, unfortunately, she doesn't get to do a whole heck of a lot. Um, she stops Kong and Godzilla from fighting each other and gets them to join forces. And then she participates a little bit in the final battle, but that's all we get from Mothra. Uh, it's not even clear if the Mothra in this film is the same Mothra from the 2019 film, but reincarnated or re like brought back to life. Or if it's a new Mothra entirely. That's not entirely clear, but um, in any case, uh, they do like a scene where Mothra stops Godzilla from beating up on Kong to get them to join forces and go up against Scar King and Shimo, which could have been a great, uh, which was a, a callback to Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster where Mothra has to talk Rodan and Godzilla out of fighting each other to go fight King Ghidorah. That's absolutely what they were referencing, no doubt about it. But that movie, the earlier movie, did a full-on monster conference sequence where the monsters are talking to each other um, with a translation provided to us by the by Mothra's fairies, and um, it was uh, uh, it, it was a very anthropomorphizing scene for the monsters. And you know, some people hate it, some people love it. I I love it personally because it was like the start of Godzilla's face turn, and that was a big moment for me as a kid. And I would have liked, if you're going to reference that and repeat that, then I would have liked for it to have like somewhat of a monster conference where Godzilla and Kong are kind of stating their cases and snarling at each other. And Godzilla ultimately comes around. But it happens so quickly that Godzilla just like, it's like he gets, he's beating up on Kong, ready to kill him. And then he gets blasted by Mothra, who's like, nah, he's cool. And she chirps at him a couple of times and Godzilla's like, okay, yeah, he is cool. And it would have been nice to see a little bit more of a, a back and forth and then a turn for Godzilla's character there that was a little less sudden. Um, so, um, yeah, like I said, there's there's things they could have done to make the monster spectacle aspect 
land a little bit more. And I think the biggest problem with the film overall for me, Scar King and Shimo are introduced into the film way too late. I think they come in at like the hour point at the hour mark or something at like two thirds of the movie is done by that point, by the time they come in and we haven't even seen our top threat yet. And it's, you know, again, Kong carries the movie effectively and Godzilla does some cool things to hold our attention, but the threat is not really felt in the film, unfortunately, because the villains are introduced way too late. And it would have been nice if they opened up with a scene of Scar King and Shimo. And if you want to cover them in shadows and obscure them, and then save them for the big reveal for when Kong meets them, that's fine. But it would have been nice to open up the film with a uh, Scar King, Shimo, and Scar King's army, um... Um, attacking uh, like a monarch base or something, or maybe fi uh, finding Godzilla and attacking him and ambushing him, uh, something like that to kind of establish a threat right off the bat. And maybe Kong throughout the film is investigating uh, mysterious attacks and you know why are why are why are there ice blasts all over the place? Why is why is the terrain in Hollow Earth turning to ice? What's going on? And have Kong like play detective, I guess, monster detective, I guess, and go investigate it. Um, that would have been, that would have made Scar King and Shimo's threat a little bit more apparent because as is, it kind of rings hollow and it never feels like a major world ending threat the way King Ghidorah did in the 2019 film, for example, or even the Mudos in the 2014 film. And they were just trying to feed, ne feed a nest. That's all they were trying to do, but they felt like that, you know, them doing that was going to bring about the end of the world. So that was effective, but Scar King never quite, got to that level despite having a, an appropriately deranged personality and, and elements of a fun villain. He's barely explored at all. I think we get the introductory scene and then the final battle and that's pretty much it, which is unfortunate. It felt like they, uh, there was some untapped potential there with Scar King's character, which again is unfortunate, but, um, so yeah, I, I mean, like I said, it's this is a movie that delivers on the monster spectacle, but even in that type of film, I feel like there's things they could have done to make it land a little bit better. But overall, I wasn't bored by the film. And I'll say this, I enjoyed this more than I did Monarch Legacy of Monsters, which that show definitely kind of bored me. I and mean, that was a bit of a drag to sit through, which is unfortunate because I love Kurt Russell, but it is what it is. Uh, so I did enjoy it more than Monarch. Um, I still say it's the weakest of the MonsterVerse films, but... There is fun to be had, and it sounds like a lot of people had fun because it did pretty well at the box office, overperformed, and I'm sure we will get more MonsterVerse after this. Um, hopefully they, you know, kind of expand on what they do with the monsters in the next film because there's a lot of potential, and like I said, this film had a lot more potential to be a lot more fun, and they kind of undercut themselves at certain point, points by uh, not not adding those extra details to make things land a little bit better. And that, um, and I felt like this film kind of left, left some potential on the table when they could have done some cool things. But uh, overall, it is a good time. It is an okay film and pure popcorn entertainment. And if you like giant monsters going boom, this movie's got you covered. So nothing wrong with that. But I am done for now. This long ass video is finally concluded. Thank you everybody for watching. Remember to submit your questions to askpatrick2024 at gmail.com. I will have that information down below in the description, but that is all I have for you now. Thanks again everybody for listening and I will see you all later.